Good morning. So everybody has a favorite food, right? Nan, what's your favorite food? Something sweet. Something sweet. Wonderful. Cherise, what's your favorite food? Seafood? All right. Anybody else? Shout out a favorite food. Hamburgers. Hamburgers. Delicious. I love all those things very much. Bacon. But bacon. Delicious. Put it all together even better. But I have to say my favorite food is probably bread. You can ask Cherise and she'll tell you the same exact thing. If we were on one of those deserted islands and you could only bring one thing, it would be bread. Any kind of bread. I mean, just picture on that deserted island, the sun, you know, by the water, and a nice slab of Avani's bread. Warm. Or maybe even like a big basket of like the Red Lobster Cheddar Biscuits. Oh, yum. So in today's gospel, again, we hear about bread, but this is not, and this is like for the last couple gospels, last Sundays we've heard about this, and this isn't John talking in circles, or writing in circles, this isn't Jesus repeating himself. On the contrary, this is all new stuff that we're hearing. Jesus tells us in the gospel that he is the bread of life, and that whoever comes to me will not go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And how do the people respond, or more specifically the Jews respond? They doubt. They ask, how can this be? Because we know this person, we know Jesus, he came from Mary, Joseph, you know, we lived with them, we know them. These words are from the Jews are not complaints about Jesus, they're arguments to what Jesus is saying. By this time, Jesus has, uh, has had enough and pretty much uh, tells them to shut up. <laughs> Um, the language is stop grumbling amount amongst yourselves. It has the connotation of stop talking and listen to what I have to tell you. These words from Jesus are to show that the Jews are not, have not understood anything that he's been telling them up to this point. The remaining portion of today's text introduces entirely new material, though the words may seem familiar. Jesus begins to call his followers to a real decision about who he is. He talks about coming to me. The first time it's stated kind of negatively, um, no one is able to come to me unless drawn by my father. And the Greek verb, elkuse, translated as drawn in today's text, could be translated as the more intensive word, dragged. No one comes to Jesus without the father's pull. No one comes to Jesus without the father dragging them to him. Next, Jesus states it more positively, saying that all who hear the Father's teaching and learn from it will come to the Father. This can have many meanings. To the Jews in Jesus' context, it can mean believing in the messianic promise that Jesus would be fulfilling. In John's context, it can mean stepping outside of Jewish tradition and embracing Christianity. For our own context and our own time, it could be moving outside of the typical pattern of our own culture. Either way, Jesus is saying that faith is extremely important. It helps us understand things that might be difficult for us. Lastly, Jesus talks about how he is the living bread from heaven. He uses this phrase to try and change the already developed concept that the Jews have. The Jews grumbling was because they were trying to fit Jesus into their concept of their own scripture. Bread equals the manna from heaven. Um, the miracle feeding that happened a couple Sundays ago fits into the food that filled their ancestors. But anything outside of this context is hard for them to understand. Jesus uses this tool to try to explain what is ahead of him. He says, I am the bread, the bread I will give for you for the life of the world is my flesh. This promise is one thing that is resounding to me. He is trying to explain that he will be giving up his body for us that we may live. He is flipping the context of the Jews to make them break down their barriers and listen to God speaking. And we, in turn, in today's society, in today's culture, must ask ourselves the same question. We must flip our own belief systems upside down to hear Jesus' word and to follow him. So, I have to say that I've always loved bread. I actually started to really contemplate God's role for me through bread. Um, to start off, I've always been pretty close to my faith. I was raised in a Catholic church, and my mother, who's here today, um, was one of my biggest influences in my Catholic upbringing, and one who has always supported my decisions when it's come to my discernment. I distinctly remember when all the kids were getting married on the playground, I was the one officiating all the services. <laughs> always the priest, pastor, never the bride, or groom, or whatever. I was very involved in our church. I was an altar server for many years, becoming the one who would always serve at that early 6.30 in the morning service on Sundays because nobody else wanted to get up that early on a Sunday. 
Um, I actually enjoyed it and became very close to uh, Father Henry, who was known for his five-minute sermons. He'd actually be very upset that I'm taking so much time talking right now. <laughs> Um, as I grew older and entered high school, I developed a close personal relationship with one of the monks, Father uh, Dominic. Um, he was a very different priest. Um, he had a show on TV called Breaking Bread with Father Dominic. It was a baking show where he would um, bake different kinds of breads and then connect them and relate them to spiritual practices, like bambino bread with the uh, um, overlapping of the bread. It kind of resembles the baby Jesus in the swaddling clothes. He would invite us to bake with him after school, and eventually I was asked to accompany him and an, another student on trips across the state, um, doing bread demos for churches, congregations, and big events. Um, he taught me to be able to see God in everything we do, from the small menial things like doing dishes, homework, and yes, even breaking bread. Uh, my sophomore year, he suggested that I make a tech, and that's called Teens Encounter Christ. It is the Catholic version of uh, Via de Cristo. Um, I loved my tech. I was able to spend a weekend without technology um, or any other distractions in life and just focus on God, on God's time. I liked it so much that I ended up being a part of every single weekend for three years straight. That's 12 weekends total in three years. During one of the weekends, I had my, I guess you can call it revelation, um, on die day, which is the first day we get there, which is supposed to um, resemble the, the grain of wheat that falls to the ground and dies and becomes new life. Um, and we talk about God's dying, or Jesus dying on the cross. We go into a dark church, and we just sit there and pray while we have these beautiful people singing these reflective hymns up in the choir loft. I asked myself in that church just to be open to God's calling and that I would be trying to understand what I should do. Sure, I said that, but I really didn't expect any big thing to come out of it. Um, the next day, um, we received ashes, and when we had our ashes taken off, we were anointed with oil. The words that go along with this action are, um, God's child, I anoint you as priest, prophet, and king. And the spiritual director on that weekend grabbed my arm as soon as I walked by and said, you know, you make a really great priest. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, God, for throwing that at me. Um, talk about God hitting me over the head. Um, so that's what I thought his plan was for me. I was going to become a priest. After that weekend, um, I thought about it for a long time, I considered it, I prayed about it, I discussed my plans with uh, my spiritual advisors, with my family. Um, in the end, I decided that wasn't my calling. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to be a dad. And I thought that that was what I really should be doing. Moving forward to when Cherise enters the picture, um, we met during school and show choir, and I fell in love with her. She was beautiful, strong, independent, funny, and we had a lot of, a lot of interests in common. We moved to Chicago for me to study religion and history. It's still hard for me to believe that she's moved all over the state with me. Um, I was still having that calling to the church, but I didn't know how to exactly pursue it. We eventually decided to get married in the Lutheran Church, and this is where I met Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott was the pastor of the church back in Princeton, where Cherise um, went when she was younger. He was a very awesome guy, very laid back, who really was patient with me asking me so many questions about the Lutheran faith. After talking to him and with Cherise, I felt like this was a better fit for me and my beliefs. After church hopping for a couple years, we ended up here with you fine folks. That pull from God was always there, and, would, and I would have ongoing conversations with Cherise, and at one point she asked me what I wanted to do with my life or career, or what I wanted to be when I grew up. I told her that I wanted to help people. I want to be around people. I want to be involved in the church. Her response was, well, you know, you could be a pastor. I think you'd make a good pastor. Believe me, I had thought of it, but hearing it come from her was a solidifying note that I needed to make that next jump. We still had a lot of other issues that made it hard for me to make this move, but thanks to you all, my extended church family, my calling is coming to fruition. You have all brought us into this family with open arms. Literally, Nan gave us all a big hug the first day we came here. And you have made an incredible contribution to my school, which we are internally grateful for. 
I couldn't wish for a better congregation or a better family to be a part of. I believe this is what God has called me to do, and I'm very excited to start this journey with my immediate family and in turn with each and every one of you. There was a prayer or saying that I would say every night while I was discerning what I should do, and that was, Lord, help me to be what you want me to be. We all have our callings in life, and through God's love and grace, we achieve greatness. The questions of who am I and what should I do suddenly become clear when we put our faith in God's love. 